Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's excited about the, uh, the Android Fireside chat we're about to have here. Now, some simple logistic things first. Um, we're we only have one microphone left that is not in our system because we have so many people, so many great leaders from Android uh, to answer questions for you. So um, first things first, I'm Dan Gallup, and I've been a long time developer Andro uh, advocate for Android and uh, developer of our Udacity courses. And we have amazing people from product, engineering, and UX here to answer your questions. So first, we're going to start off by having our panel introduce themselves. Now, two things before I do that. One is, again, there is one microphone. You see it there. If you want to ask questions, please line up behind the microphone. And please do ask questions, because this is all about you. We've also taken some questions uh, from uh, the internet, which we will be asking our, our, our panel as well. And the second thing is, please uh, don't ask about things in the far future that they, you know our team can't comment on, as well as uh, try not to, to actually call out individual panelists. They know who they are, and they can answer questions uh, very, very well themselves. So uh, let them figure out who's going to answer. Uh, so without further ado, our distinguished panel. And we'll start from uh, right to left. Which right? Stage right? Stage right, yes. Stage right. Stage right. Okay. Stage right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Sharkey. I'm a software engineer on the framework team. Chad Haas, I am an engineer on the UI Toolkit team. Eid Boyar, also an engineer in the UI Toolkit team. Uh, Diane Hackborn, an engineer on the framework team. George Mount, I'm a UI engineer on the UI Toolkit team. Uh, Romagi, I used to be an engineer on the UI Toolkit team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris Redd, I'm an engineer on the system UI team. Hi, I'm Rachel Garb, I'm on the UX team. Hi, I'm Rashad Alao, I'm an uh, engineer on the media team. Hi, I'm Adam Powell, engineer, UI Toolkit team. I'm Chris Baines, and I'm an engineer in de developer relations. And I'm Rafe Levine, an engineer on the UI Toolkit team. All right, so we have an amazing panel here for you guys. It is, it is so exciting to be up here with these people that I've worked with for the last five plus years in many cases. All right, so I'm going to pull a question from the internet first, uh, a nice one. All right, so from, this was from, uh, from David. Why did the build that version codes convention change from the full tasty treat name to just the letter in Marshmallow? Uh, so the answer for that is those, those names in there are the code names for the platform, and we don't have code names anymore. Um, because what happens is that early on, we said, like, OK, we need a code name for our platform so we can call it something before we're done. And marketing gives it its final version number that they want to go public with. And the code names over time, as you've seen, have become more, um, more of a, product, a marketing thing than the actual version numbers. So by M now, basically, marketing, is, marketing has taken over the name. We don't know the name before we're done with the SDK, so <laughs> end up with M. Yeah, it really helps us from leaking things. Um, <laughs> none of us know what's going on. Uh, all right, so uh, one, another question from the net. Again, please line up behind the mic. We'll also take some there. So uh, we would like to know why the permission for drawing over other apps is considered dangerous and cannot be requested. Uh, I guess I'll take that yeah, one. Yeah, take too. that one too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the runtime permissions are are uh, designed around um, access to personal information. So you'll see most, of, pretty much all the runtime permissions are like the user can understand about like, oh, can the application get to this stuff about me? And so we thought that was really important for them to be able to answer these, th these prompts that they're going to see a lot. Um, the draw over applications is actually a really tricky one because it's, it's a source of a lot of malware that we have. It can be abused for a lot of things. It's one of those things that's like, with great power, you can like mess up the user really well. So, so um, we really wanted to protect this more. So we really felt it was important that for the application to get this, they need to go through a little more um, invasive UI where we can t explain to the user what this is and kind of more discourage applications from using it. OK, um, here's, here's another one. Why do you choose statics for your APIs? It makes testing so hard. <laughs> I think I got the right inflection there. Um, anyone? <laughs> It would be interesting to know what they're talking about in particular. I know we use static methods a lot in support library as a way to then shim down to the appropriate runtime version. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's a mechanism for us to then delegate to the appropriate runtime bits. Um, other than that, I don't know specifically what they're talking about. I, I thought it was just because we hate our users. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is specifically relating to dependency injection, why we can't 
Yeah, I, that more I, there's a very way. serious side to this question. I do not want to trivialize this question because I know a lot of people want you know, what they do want is to make our code their code more testable, and, and we want to really do want to help that. So I, I, you know, I even though I, even though I wrote it because the question was kind of whiny, um, the actual the actual content is quite serious. Yeah. yeah so I think, I, I think that the the comment of what more specifically uh, that the questioner was referring to would be really useful here. Just to sort of see how they're trying to instrument this and what they're trying to do, and we, I mean, most of these things we deal with kind of on a case by case basis. So it'd be, it'd be great to find out a little bit more information. Absolutely. Then this is this is one of the challenges with taking questions over Twitter. Um, so if you can get back to him and get, we'll just we'll wait. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please feel free to You're tweet right. again. Um, all right. So here's here's a, let's actually take an audience question now. So uh, since I see a few people lined up. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for putting uh, this event together. It's uh, really great to have this like focused, uh, you know, pure Android uh, event. Hey, come on. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, my question is actually very related to the the previous session about uh, permissions, um, uh, and I think it's. Uh, 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 important for everyone to, to know the answer. Uh, so, so one of the solutions uh, to avoid asking for permissions was to use uh, some of the system event, uh, intents. Uh, for example, if you wanted to capture a uh, uh, picture, uh, use the uh, media capture uh, action in, uh, instead of like a asking for permission to access the camera, uh, or if you wanted to save a contact, etc. Uh, a few. It's been a while since I touched the camera uh, stuff, but if uh, I remember a few years ago. Basically, each OEM that shipped their own uh, camera application would uh, treat the, you know, would respond to that uh, the media capture uh, action differently. So they would return, like one of them would return uh, a thumbnail of the image in their in the data uh, part of the intent. Uh, another one would return a URI, which was probably the expected behavior, um, and so on. Uh, same with uh, I think uh, I think like uh, even attaching something like some. You know, email clients or some uh, third-party, um, you know, um, uh, email clients or apps. Like when you try to attach something, uh, do it one way, one expect it like in one way versus a, uh, another. So, um, are any of these have any of these been maybe added to the CTS to ensure that you know I'll, I get consistent behavior when I use the intent, uh, the media capture intent, for example, or the other intents, or 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 not? If not, then how do we really work around that? Because yeah, a yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, so for the action, the image capture stuff, you're right. As far as CTS, what's in there right now? All it does right now is assert that somebody is there that handles the intent. Mm -hmm. um, but what we've tried doing uh, with some of the uh, documents UI things, the so the create document, get content intents, uh, we've actually started using UI Automator to not just to launch the intent and to start interacting with whatever UI the OEM has presented there uh, to actually try picking a file and to make sure that we get back the file we expect and we're able to work with it. So we've had good success with it there with those intents. Um, and we're starting to look at like how do we extend that to some of the other ones, like the image capture, so that we can assert strongly like that you as a developer get back, uh, like whether it's a full resolution image or a, strong, a stronger contract uh, for the, between you and the camera app. So we're looking at improving it. Thank you. All right, next audience question. Hey, I, I hope this is a simple question. So um, <laughs> I, what's the recommended way to sync data from an app to the server and back from the server to the app. Because, yeah, they were, um, the talk this morning was talking about a way other than the sync adapter. And you know, I was looking at the Udacity classes, and they were saying sync adapter was the way. So. All right, just, just, just one thing on the Udacity classes. We, we wrote the Udacity class before Job Scheduler existed or GCM Network Manager existed. So, so that, is, that, is, that is one thing there. We haven't updated that part of the class since then. Um, but I'll let the rest of the panel handle that from beyond that. I, I don't think we have like one certain way of doing things. Job Scheduler provides a great API for like when you want to be done. You want to, like, the battery full or there's like wireless network, that kind of stuff is good for them. And there's also things like my user just send a message, I want to send this to server, you better send it yourself. I think it's like the best way because you really want to send it as soon as possible. And if you rely on the rest of it, we, we try to bash things. That's why the job schedule is great. And otherwise, do it yourself. I don't know. If, I don't yeah, I think that if you're looking for something that's a little bit more turnkey end to end that gives you uh, kind of some higher level 
uh, constructs for working with that. I think you might want to talk to some of the Firebase folks out in the uh, sandbox area and uh, Q&A area for office hours. Uh, they might be able to point you in a direction that has something um, a little bit more high level than the, just the raw platform constructs, just because those do provide some of the other server-side component and integration that you might look at for something like that. Someone was mentioning something in Google Play services that helped, like a sync, uh, I guess Radar was, I don't know, that when we were talking? Yeah, there were, that's, that's the, the GCM network manager code. And, and the nice thing about GCM network manager is that it actually does a lot of the power saving things that we added to the platform later, but it brings it back to earlier versions of Android. So, that's, so it, it's, a, it's a very friendly thing to use. Uh, in that sense, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't do everything that Job Scheduler does, but it does, a, it does the most important things. And, it, and a lot of people, Sync Adapter might be a little bit overkill for because they don't need the accounts part of it. Uh, you know, they just they just want something that's going to start up, that's going to survive boots, and it's going to get them reliable syncing. And so, something like GCM Network Manager is 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 useful because it can do that uh, across many versions of the platform. Even even before we started doing some of the the battery optimizations we did we did later on around around Sync Adapters. I mean, like, just keep in mind, it really depends on your use case. Like, if, if, the day, like, if you are trying to send analytics information, use the job schedule, GCM network manager. But it's like, if it's time sensitive, those things work well because they batch, like, they are lazy. It's yeah. good for the device. But if you have tons, time sensitive information, like, do it yourself. Okay. Have a job, like, there's multiple solutions out there. Okay, Thank, thanks very much. Excellent. I'll do one more audience question here. Looks like a few. Yeah. So if I can just hijack the previous statics question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And it, it wasn't actually my question. But uh, it's something that I've run into lately. I think um, Google Play Services is a really good example of that, where uh, for things like location services, GCM, GCM Network Manager, they've all seemed to sort of standardize on static methods on everything, which does make testing really hard, uh, especially for things like, like geofencing and that type of stuff. Can you say that in a whiny voice? <laughs> <laughs> Why are they static? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that didn't work. We didn't get us an answer any faster. Um, I like the question. That was, yeah, it was good, yeah. yeah. So thank you for pointing out uh, some of the Play Services libraries in particular for that. We'll definitely take that feedback to the team. <laughs> That's a great non-answer. <laughs> that was good. All right. So Joe asks, could you discuss the, the new bottom navigation bar in the new Google Plus app that is only mentioned as something <laughs> uh, that is mentioned as something not to do on, on, uh, on DAC? Rachel, do you want to start with that one? Sure. <laughs> so the Google Plus team is experimenting with new UI approaches. Um, and they do this from time to time. It doesn't always result in a material design pattern. It hasn't resulted in a material design pattern in this case. Um, so the feedback that you have about it is going to be very helpful to the Google Plus team and also the material design team as they decide what to do moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Is, 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 any, anyone have, anyone, so who, 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 who doesn't like it? Um, I just a show of hands, just right. Okay, that's, okay. That's there's, there's some interesting Deal. feedback there. Um, so, go, go on, Adam. <laughs> uh -huh. Is iterating like this referred to as bottom-up design then? <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so I mean, in all seriousness though, I think that's really kind of the way to take it. Google's a very large organization. We have a lot of other apps teams. And as you all know from working with your teams and your designers and your product teams, all of these people have all of these other ideas that they kind of want to put forward and, and try things out. And I think that there's, there's a lot of that same sort of sentiment within Google and within other Google Apps teams as well. It's part of the reason why we don't always integrate everything every Google App team does into something like the material design spec or into a support library or into any of these things immediately. Because these teams really do just kind of want to try some things and see what sticks and see what, uh, see what people like. And this is something that we've gotten a lot of feedback on since that particular launch. So thank you for providing that. I mean, that, that really is part of the process. Awesome. All right. Next audience question. Uh, hi. Uh, you know, uh, to be backward compatible uh, when there's new API, it's whether it be in support library or Google Play services. Uh, so one of them is open source. One of uh, the other is not. Uh, so for example, Fuse Location Provider, it's just about location and 
not about uh, Google services, uh, actually. It requires GMS, of course, but uh, which determines uh, for new APIs to be on which? All right, so, which, so wait, what determines whether an API is part of, of Google Play services or, or part of the platform? Yeah, I, I can address it. So the location stuff in being in uh, Google Play services actually had nothing to do with backwards compatibility or giving to other devices. It came about because as we developed the location services, originally we just had like, well, there was GPS, so that was your location, and then we did cell. And as it evolved, you do Wi-Fi-based location, we realized you can't really do modern location services on these devices without having a lot of interaction with backend servers that have a lot of data about that they use to do this location stuff. So we realized the platform location APIs were becoming these kind of hollow APIs that didn't actually have any open source implementation behind them because the platform couldn't do the stuff that, that we were saying it would do. So that was actually the reason why location went into Google Play services because we realized actually location is really a Google service, it's not a platform service. Okay. And, and if you want to see why, you know, the, the difference between support library and Google Play services is, is really about that. Google Play services is Google proprietary services that basically are dependent on back-end Google services. The support library is all open source code that is, can operate all by itself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, <coughs> what is this about performance and enums and int def? Um, <laughs> We have, there, 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 there has sure. definitely been a lot of you know, uh, talk about it. What, you know, what, what, anyone want to comment on, on the panel? Can we get this? everyone for, for one side on one side of the room? And the other side <laughs> of the room. So, we'll we'll think about some water balloons. I can do it if the voice comes back. Let me try. OK. Um, so originally, we just wanted to let, you know, guy, to let you guys know what is the cost of an enum so that you understand when you use them what the cost is. Just like you know, if you use a double with a big D and you put like a million of them in a hash map, what is going to be the cost? Uh, once you have that information, uh, you can make an informed decision about whether or not to use them. Enums are great. They're super useful. Uh, you can put methods on them. Uh, there are many cases where they, they, are, they are useful. They exist in the platform. If you look at the source code of the framework, you'll see them used in a bunch of places. So it's really about you know, understand the cost of everything so you can decide on a case-by-case -case basis. So if we ever say never use them or always use them, uh, that's not what we mean. So what I just heard is Roman says always use them or never use them. <laughs> 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 exactly. One or the other, there's no, there's no middle ground. Um, no, it's, it's just like with everything, you know, understand what you're doing. Don't do it blindly because you've been told in an article to never use them or to always use them. Just understand what's going on. I think um, you know, the, the most important thing by far to do is measure. And, uh, and I think the thing maybe why like, uh, enums are so controversial is that if you have assumptions about Java on a desktop or a server, those assumptions are not necessarily going to apply on the platforms, on the device. So, but the real answer is measure. And if the answer is, it isn't really performance critical, make your code clean. And if the answer is, it is on a performance hot path, then do something different than you would on a desktop. Yeah, part of the reason why this ends up being such a topic of discussion is just because it is one of those things that tends to come out in API. And it ends up coming out in API in places where many, many parts of your code are going to call into it. And it's one of those areas that really does kind of contribute to performance death by a thousand cuts or memory death by a thousand cuts in one scenario or another. Any one of these things really isn't going to hurt you all that much on its own, especially if it's just kind of off the beaten path. But if it adds up and you do measure and you find out later on that, wow, I really do have a problem here, then what do you do about it? I mean, you, you sit down and you say to yourself, OK, well, I'm going to go ahead and fix this. What does that refactoring look like if you find out that like a million of these things across your code base is causing a problem? So I mean, that's part of the reason why it's one of the things that we've harped on is just because it does tend to have that quality of high visibility across your code base such that if you find that you have to make a change later on, it can end up being a very expensive change. So it's part of the reason why we say, you know, measure up front and really kind of think about it and know the costs from the beginning. I, I thought it was defensive, like, whoa, whoa, we're never going to use enums. We, we always use ints. Like, oh, no. <laughs> so you guys have to do the same thing we do, right? No, it's not that. Oh. No. Well, I mean, <laughs> we, we can also just, again, like Roman says, never use them. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ten. Yeah. So Always think, use them? Yeah, the public APIs, we're being conservative because we don't yeah. know how, what types of apps or how you're going to be using these things. So we're careful. We don't let ourselves use enums but in our public APIs, but that shouldn't let you from using it, like, keep you from using them. And there are That's two also places good. where we use both. Uh, so the, the Skia drawing API is a good example. Like some of the parameters, uh, like the transform modes, the blending modes, they're defined as enums on the Java side. But when you create an object with one of those enums, we turn the enum into an int internally. So you know. So always so we, use both. we use both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Don't follow that That's example. Though. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Actually, the, the framework um, usage or, or lack thereof of enums is a good example. One of the, one of the places that we really wanted people to understand where it may bite you or your developers is in developing libraries. The reason that we don't use them in our APIs in general is. <laughs> that we would then inflict that damage upon your app, and we do not know what your app is going to try to do with all those APIs. So wouldn't it be better if we streamline our APIs so that you didn't suffer repercussions that, w that we couldn't foresee? On the same hand, if you're developing a library that is then going to be used by tons of application developers, you should think very carefully about using things like that because, again, you're making a policy decision on behalf of the users, the clients of your library. So there it becomes a lot more important instead of like, you know, in your application, you, you want to use an enum, knock yourself out. I really couldn't care less. If you're writing a library, be aware of the danger before you do that and measure to make sure the. And the uh, real if you effect. want a great, examples of, a great example of how not to use them, so recently, uh, PY from uh, Square, a friend of mine, <laughs> released a library called Fragnums, uh, where he shows you how you can replace fragments with enums. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> it works. <laughs> All right, let's let's go to another audience question. And please, if you have questions, line up. Right, you know, we, we really do want to answer your questions. This is an incredibly rare thing. We haven't done one of these since 2014. So uh, so please ask. Please come and line up and ask your questions. Hi. I don't have a question. I'm here to plug my talk tomorrow about Android testing. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> we I will sure. talk about. Couldn't testing. see from that distance. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will be talking about testing in, in isolation. And in fact, if you are watching this on YouTube, you should just swat, uh, switch to the YouTube video uh, <laughs> <laughs> right now. Dan, we need a net blocker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. I know. Uh, but yeah, and actually, there's a you know a bunch of there are questions that are going to be answered in a whole bunch of uh, great talks we have for tomorrow. So uh, that but don't let that stop you from actually asking questions now. So yeah, the short answer is isolation, isolation, uh, isolating from the framework and GMS core and everything. So exactly. Uh, All right, next 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 actual question. Um, <laughs> or you can provide an answer to someone else's question. Exactly. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, hello. Uh, so I asked this to one of the, the people on stage, but I wanted to broaden the question to all of you. Uh, so will there ever be style guidelines for XML resources and our, yeah, all the XML we write, basically? Because the SDK uses different versions. We have camel case and we have underscore and, yeah. The, oh. the, the, I've seen ton, tons of different variants. So the, the SDK uses a pretty consistent uh, convention for some of this stuff. It's just, it uses the conventions based on the type of resources that they are. So, um, Diane, if you want to jump in and. Yeah. Yeah, you, <laughs> you want me to explain the convention? It's too uh, complicated. Well, I mean, you, you, have, you do have one of those things named after you. I can so. explain some of them. Uh, so, <laughs> in attributes, underscores. In tag names, dashes. But if the tag name is a view, then you know, camel case. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was perfectly clear. And that's not even yeah, actually there, right. So they explain. <laughs> part, part, so part of the convention came because um, a lot of resources come from just f files on the file system. So we realized, oh well, you can't use case for those because you can be on caseless file systems and stuff. And so a lot of those get forced into like just pure, you know lowercase with underscores, which we don't like. So we use different things elsewhere, because why not? Um, we actually, <laughs> so and actually, um, for, um, for attributes, we use the convention that where, um, because attributes can either be for the child or the parent, we have the convention where it's um, layout underscore and then a name, or else the other na name with camel case, so that you can distinguish them. But, but yeah, I, I, the, the conventions are very complicated. And the attributes mostly <laughs> have the names of the setters and fields in Java, mostly. 
<laughs> so what I'm hearing is maybe we should have a more discoverable point of documentation for this. Maybe so. We'll make a transcript of this video and publish that. <laughs> hey, Chet, can you put that on your blog? <laughs> oh. All right, next question, please. All right, so uh, without getting into sort of another enum type of discussion, <laughs> um, which I don't want to bring do, it. We can enumerate but, uh, the enum discussions. <laughs> no, it's uh, fun. After, after. Um, <laughs> I am curious, though, what do you guys think of Kotlin in the ecosystem and potentially having a uh, second language becoming predominant within the community? Go. <laughs> Kotlin is completely supported. Right, so it completely supports Android, so that's not really a, a, an issue there, right? It, it support, well, it, it, there's a big difference between having like official support as in go tick the box in your IDE and get the plugin installed and it works versus having uh, really idiomatic API support around it. I assume that that's what you mean, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess we can all kind of riff on parts of this. I mean, as a language itself, I mean, several of us have kind of looked at it and spent a little bit of time with it just in kind of some sandboxy types of uh, environments. And it's pretty cool. I mean, they've made a lot of decisions that I think uh, really are in keeping with certain patterns of efficiency and so on and so forth that we look for for something that would be targeting mobile like this. Uh, anyone else wants to kind of jump yeah, I mean, in from there? Like I'm probably the person who likes the language most here, but uh, the problem is it's not like we use it in data binding while parsing, and we use it for to prototype a lot just internally. But to put a framework support behind it is like significant step for us. That means like what do we do other people who wants to use Java, and what do we for the people who really cares about the differences? So it's it's a big decision, and I don't see the benefit of doing it. Well, you can just use Kotlin. I mean, I, I know so many people just writing their apps in Kotlin. And I, I think it's in a good state right now. Anything further is like big commitment for us. It's not easy to take. Okay. Is it, does it sound like it's one of those things where if it becomes largely supported within the community, it would at least be something that you would try to not actively try to break? That was like a triple like, negative. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry. Not, not that much. I, I don't think we're going to actively discourage you. Okay. From there's no there's no animosity. Right? Yeah. No, no, no. I, I think that like there was like for example a few versions ago, uh, part of the language specification was such that uh, the code generated by Kotlin <laughs> made it very difficult to do things like write custom views because you couldn't have enough overloaded uh, view constructors right. to allow the <laughs> inflation process to happen idiomatically, so on and so forth. Um, and you know they've since addressed things like that, and those are things where I think that they've definitely got their eyes on Android in yeah. a lot of ways, just as evidenced by changes like that and some of the discussions that went on around that type of change. So, I mean, I, I think that it'll be it'll be kind of interesting to see kind of where things go. Yeah, yeah but you know, several years ago, people were asking the same question about Scala, and it's going to be you know, a bunch <laughs> of different languages, so it's it's always going to be something new. Uh, and the thing is, the, the Android tool chain works. You know, it takes Java, you know, Java bytecode from Java C. So if the language outputs good bytecode, like should work. Uh, at least you didn't ask for C++, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Awesome. All right, next question. Yeah, um, it was good to hear about the uh, new Android uh, development studio uh, features coming out. But I'm curious about what's being done for the sort of pure editor, you know, Emacs VI kind of people. Um, like standalone uh, layout viewers, or um, kind of, is, is there any um, focus on that, and especially guides as well, like about how to do things without like immersing yourself into the uh, into that experience? Just stop worrying and love the bomb, man. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have channel Stephanie from this morning's keynote. There's no better time to start using Android. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been using I, for like 20 years. Yeah. So no, it's true. I mean, I, I would. I mean, Gradle is Gradle is pretty usable from the command line. It's certainly done that. And so, if you if you if you absolutely want to use your own editor, but the thing is, what's great about what we're doing with Android Studio is all of this runtime, real time code updates, things that you can't do very easily. Um, you know, with 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 those kinds of tools. So, I mean, we could build integrations for each one of them, but I think that it really is a great time to go out and try what we're doing with Android Studio. Anyone else want to, yeah, want to comment I, I mean, on that? I mean, joking aside, I would definitely pose the same question to some of the tools folks tomorrow. 
um, in the, in the oh, yeah, session with that. That was the other thing I would say. We have a fireside chat with all the tools team tomorrow. So if, you're, if you really want to get this kind of support available for, for other editors and other tool chains, um, definitely ask the question to them as well. And now they'll be prepared for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question. Uh, hello again. Uh, I was, I, um, this might be covered in one of tomorrow's talks, maybe, but I was wondering if uh, uh, an update on Jack and Jill uh, might be uh, provided, and also um, what the implications of that would be on using a language such as Kotlin. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Anyone want to comment on this, or do you want to punt it till tomorrow? It's up, it's up to all of you. I think it's tomorrow. Let's punt it. <laughs> I think I think it's a better I think that's a better question for the tools team for tomorrow again for the fire for the fireside chat there. So, thanks though. We'll yeah, definitely uh, come back. Are we taking some of these down so that we can just feed it for, into the initial questions? For uh, that's a good point. I'll I'll I'll. I'll Anybody I'll, else have any other questions for tomorrow's session? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can I, I I can type. All right. Next next audience question. All seriousness. Um, yeah, we've been doing. Uh, camera work since, I don't know, early 2012, and right. life so. hasn't gotten a lot easier for us. Um, I think that the Camera 2 APIs are great, but Thanks. even on phones that support those, uh, some of the functionality is kind of invisible, it doesn't work. Um, I, I'm wondering, I understand that it's very difficult to support such a large ecosystem, but I'm wondering if you guys view that as your problem or kind of our problem. Because um, it's <laughs> it's it's something that it, it's something that um, family members, friends, sort of refuse to use the apps we build because oftentimes the 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 connection to the media player, or the connection to the media hardware, recording, etc., is just unpredictable. Um, and I'm wondering kind of what you guys are doing towards that, and if you do view it as your problem, or if you kind of think of Nexus as sort of your little world where you can kind of. Oh, it's <laughs> definitely an Android problem. And that's something that we spent a lot of time trying to resolve. So the first step was bringing a new API that could enable you guys to develop great applications. So that's the first thing we did. And the second thing is basically make sure that A, it's adapted, and B, it's well tested. So on the testing uh, side, we revamp our testing infrastructure to add, to add additional mandatory tests for around image quality and also around the APIs that are being used. If you're familiar with Camera 2, the API surface is really huge. And I think what you're seeing there is, uh, because the API surface is so large, it's hard to test all the combination of every single instance of other parameters you can configure. We're, we're making progress, but the coverage is far from 100%. Um, but for us, it's a top priority, because without that, you cannot have a consistent set of applications being developed and have those applications work across the ecosystem perfectly. So, we're on it, it's one step at a time, but clearly, uh, I mean, it's a top priority to make sure that that coverage is as wide as possible to cover as many use cases as possible. Hmm? All right, next question. Um, uh, can you give us a sense on how big the Android framework team is and how it has grown the, the past few years? It's all of us, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 have to, we have to constrain the, sign of the size of the team to how many people we can fit on the stage. <laughs> and, uh, Laid off the rest. So, I mean, really, the size of the team is mostly just constrained by the, the size of the buildings that they give us. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's we, not that constrained by that. <laughs> well, well, I, mean, I mean, they, they figured out more ways of smashing people into smaller spaces. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, um, yes. And, I mean, we did have uh, uh, one of our other team members visiting from a remote office uh, where there, there's photographic evidence of him setting up a temporary desk, which consisted of him stacking two empty cardboard boxes, one on top of another, next to a whiteboard on which there was a, a drawing of a little house plant. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we've got some uh, constraints that we're optimizing for in that. <laughs> the team is a lot smaller than you would think. Yeah, and I would say you could actually derive the answer to that by looking at the Git logs. You yeah, could probably work and figure out how many people are making commits and who the core mm -hmm. members are. And the rest of us are going to meetings. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, my question is not only about Android, but also about Chrome. We heard many things about like, we, Google may merge the Android system and the Chrome system together. Can we share something more about it? And uh, when do we like really able to uh, build an Android app and also able to run on the Chrome system? Well, we have Arc Welder already. 
So let's, let's, let's just say that. So if you really want to run your Android app on top of Chrome OS, you know, we, have, we do have a solution for that. And as far as the other answer, um, no comment. <laughs> that would be one of those asking about the future questions. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask whether there'll be like ORM support for SQLite on Android. Because we have been writing a lot of boilerplate code around it. And if it was there, it would be useful. So maybe I can so, answer sure. this. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so this is, this is actually something I personally thought about working on. Uh, it's a little bit individual because there is like a bunch of really good solutions that work well. Like there's ORM libraries. I use one of them for the demo. It's a company called RAM. They're doing really cool stuff. And so we are debating whether like, I mean, the community is coming up with good solutions. And we bringing one more solution to the table, unless we do something better, doesn't seem to add any value. So if we think that we can do something better, we would provide it. Otherwise, there's like great open source solutions that you can choose from. And which one do you s I cannot name any like that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I know you asked, you told that there should not be any future um, feature questions, but will there be a NoSQL solutions for Android? Same as you could use level DB. I mean, this. I was going to say, yeah. There's there's open source projects that are that are that are there. I mean, I think you know that uh, without expanding the framework tremendously, you know, I think I think there 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 are great opportunities out there if you don't like what we have built in. And so it's, that's yeah. It's more like like we have limited. Like we have like 12 people in the framework, so we <laughs> <laughs> so we try to spend our resources like more efficiently. So writing a like. Key value database for Android doesn't really make sense while there are like great solutions there. It's more about providing the infrastructure that other people can build on for domain specific solutions. Right? So if what we were providing was so limited that nobody was providing these other things or they were in inherently you know, too expensive for people to use, then clearly there's something that we can do in the infrastructure yeah. to enable that ecosystem. If that ecosystem is already enabled, what value are we adding by just adding something else to it. Exactly. I mean, you know, I mean again, level DB is something that, that, that's pretty brilliant. And you know, one thing we could do is make it easier to, to, to integrate that with Android as, as, a, as a toolkit that's available. But you know, again, it's, it's out there, and it's, it's, a, it's a really well-supported open source project. So next question, please. So, um, there's, there's some things that I end up doing in Android that kind of make me feel dirty, and like there must be a better <laughs> oh, way. No. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Things in Android make you feel dirty. It, Wait. I, look, I look on Stack Overflow. Is this, is this safe for this event? Yes. Well, OK, OK. I want to make sure. Kind of dirty. Uh, and I look on Stack Overflow, you know, and try and find a better solution, and I can't really. And, and the consensus there is to do it. So here's the example. It relates to the database. It's just like uh, creating um, an application just to get a static context that you can pass to the SQL database if you have, um, if it's accessing data and its life cycle is longer than an activity. So is that, is that like something, I mean that's the consensus of how to do it on Stack Overflow. Like how, how, if, you, if you just use the, the application context, the applica and the application goes through its life cycle, that turns null and your database crashes. Uh, that's not true. Yeah, it does. No. <laughs> I was going to say, wait, hold on. <laughs> uh, the, the, the application context is created as it's, it's a global to the process, so it does, it does not go away. Yeah, in fact, until the process goes away. Context? Emac, yeah. In well, fact, that's yeah. the biggest problem with using the application context is that it doesn't go away. <laughs> so you've got to be really careful with right, what you right, put right. in there. So, OK, OK. Well, uh, I'll, I'll take it up afterwards if I'm wrong. I mean, so, I, it could be that so something. Now I feel really dirty. <laughs> It's she does it to us all the time. So yeah. <laughs> That's good. But most of the time, a lot of times when you're using the application context, you, there's probably a better solution. So that, that would be my other thing. If you, if you find yourself using it, you know, there's a good chance you but are doing something there, there are good reasons to use it if you want to keep things outside yeah. of your like, activity or whatever like that. You just need to be aware that you're doing it. Yeah. It's, OK. So I always thought they were OK, sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right, next question. Hi, Ron. Um, I have a question about permissions. So how to gracefully um, handle the situation when the user permanently denies uh, the permission which is critical for your app? Let's say camera permission for the camera app. 
<laughs> I, I, I think at that point you're beyond graceful solutions. You know, it's, it's like you now have a fundamental disagreement with your user about yeah. like whether, yeah. you know. <laughs> Well, okay, if, if the app uses the camera permission uh, in the app and it's not that obvious that it's like camera app, or for example, uh, well, as I understand, there is no technical way to uh, see if the uh, permission was permanently denied. Uh, is it correct? Well, you can certainly find it if it's denied. You can just check if you have the permission. Yeah. No, well, I mean, but I mean, I mean you, can always, you can always go and say, you know, hey, this, this permission is required to run the app. I mean that's 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 certainly that's certainly within your your purview as a developer and uh, and and make, make very clear messaging around but that. But you don't get the, any kind of uh, hint that this permission was permanently denied, right? Because uh, in case if the permission is permanently denied, you can't show the dialog. You have to uh, lead. You have to open the settings uh, page and. Uh, user has have to so, manually check the permission box. Right. So I mean, you you can try to get the permission again, and you'll be told that you were it was declined, and you can tell the user, I can't do this thing because I don't have the permission. But the the idea behind this is that if the user has gone and said like stop bugging me about this permission, you know, it's it's like this is you kind of passed the point where you're having a good interaction with that user. You know, you they are they are getting annoyed with your application, and we're just trying to mitigate the situation at that point. So you should be trying to be more proactive about like when you first ask for the permission, making sure they understand why you're asking for it and that they'll agree to it. And if they don't want to at that point, they'll probably just say no. And if you keep on bothering them, then yes, they may at that point at some point say like stop asking me. Um, but you know, I think at that point you're kind of past explanations to the user about what's going on. From what I mean, you're saying, it really does seem like if the user doesn't accept the permission, they're probably not going to use your app anyway because they're not going to get any functionality out of it. Is that right? Uh, yeah, because yeah, ev everything is around the camera. So, um, so they're going to leave a one-star review saying that your app doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was just chance. thinking like how to like because it can happen by mistake. Because as you said, uh, the first time you ask for permission without any explanations, you just ask because it's safe, right? Second time you explain, but maybe well, this explanation didn't work, and uh, user permanently denies your permission, and then. You're in the state where you don't really know is it permanently denied or not, and uh, what to do. So I so. think you can use some parts of your UI to really try and communicate a little bit more with the user before you get into that like completely crazy state, right? So I mean, the option to permanently deny isn't available until the second time yeah. you ask, at least. So at the point where it's been denied for something like a camera app, for example. You can imagine like your normal camera preview window having instead, you know, some text that either looks like a test pattern, has an explanation, something clever, um, and says, you know, this is a camera app. You you need to let us access the camera if you want to, uh, if you want this app to work, and try and try and pitch your explanation as sort of like a zero state or empty state whenever the user is looking at the data set that they would normally see if you had the permission. And this kind of applies even for beyond just camera apps as well. I was having a conversation with a developer outside uh, just before this that was specifically around calendar events, for example. And, and same thing. If, you, if an application needs to access the calendar events for the day to show some sort of agenda and it can't, then you can show something meaningful in that empty state and sort of try and explain to the user, hey, normally you would see this. You're not seeing this right now because this permission was denied. Click here to fix it. And you can kind of guide the user through the steps of getting back to your intended state or not. I mean, it, it may just be that they if it's not something completely integral to your app, then you know maybe they're going to go write a review about it. It's so. just uh, I under, uh, as understood, there is no like onboarding of this like permission settings uh, page for the users. So if the user permanently denies uh, the permission, uh, he or she doesn't really know how to turn it on back because it's re it's not really clear that you have to go to the app settings and then you have to open this permission page and you have to check. Then that's may maybe language you need to provide to them if they get into a state where yeah. clearly yeah. they want this functionality. Yeah, I, mean, okay. I mean, you can move uh, from an intent into the settings page for some of this stuff, too, for yeah. the application info. And to, like, realistic, this is very, very unlikely case. Like, this well, the rare case if you no. really want to use your application but said no twice and said permanently disable, by mistake all of this happened, I think it's fine. They see a pop-up shows how to do it, and I think it's fine. Like, yeah. Focus more on trying to get people to say yes the first time. Like, 
that's what you really want to do. Okay, uh, thank you. And in the specific case of not being able to display a picture, you could optionally provide a thousand words instead. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next question. First, thank you. It's about being with a lot of analysts here. So uh, today we can do a lot with the persisting API, but why don't we have a object relational mapper? In right. the, I, the I want to do a quick poll. I was, we were wondering about the answers. How many people think that we should provide something similar to an ORM or like anything on top, more abstraction on top of the database? Like, can I see hands? How many people think we should do this? Who, want, who wants an Android ORM? Let's just make, let's be clear. Count uh, seven? Uh, like how, OK, how many people say uh, no because there is solutions out there? Uh, yeah, I think this is kind of what we think too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're data driven. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Other fires. All right, next question, please. Hi. The next question is about the Bluetooth, so probably you don't want to hear it. Um, so <laughs> we have the switch from, from BlueZ to BlueDroid, and uh, it gets worse. So basically, everybody who is using the Boole on Android, they have really huge problems. So we have behind us a lot of projects, and in all of them, we have huge problems with Bluetooth. Do you have any kind of improvements? Because uh, the, I mean, uh, we a lot of people just complain about the Bluetooth on all the possibilities, groups, and so on. So and this especially on Bluetooth Low Energy. We complain about it internally as well. <laughs> yeah. We actually, I mean, and we hear you, and that's something that we're actually actively working on to improve. Um, because we discuss about beacons, we discuss about smart devices, and we work on the edge with a lot of the, uh, devices, but we cannot provide the experience to people they are expecting from us because mm -hmm. we, we came back all the time to, I don't know, the devices, they have a really uh, bad implementation. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I heard the discussion that BlueZ will come back in Android. Do you have any idea about that? OK, I can see I mean, your faces. I can't really, I can't really comment. There's a point on your faces, too. So. Yeah, I can't really comment on what's coming back. But um, I mean, I can tell you that that's an area of active development right now. If you have any ideas for CTS tests to contribute, this is always a great time. If there's, I, I think it's a little difficult. Though. It is. Like, it is. CTS is very easy to write for like a UI toolkit where you have a known input. <laughs> 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 Them's fighting words. All right. for, for a known input and a known output. So for example, the hollow tests that you guys have, put some widgets on the screen. This is what the pixels should look like coming out the other side. You guys, there's CTS tests for that, that assert, right? On every single device, knowing what that image should exactly look like. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so not, not perfect. It was a fair assumption by okay. someone who does no UI toolkit. Right? Oh. <laughs> Fireside fight. <laughs> okay, so like uh, a database engine then. For example. There's no <laughs> database up here, so we can pick on them. Um, um, so, like a database engine, story. you have known inputs and known outputs, but something where in an RF environment yeah. where you have like multiple devices, even yeah. in this room, there's so much RF signal and interference. It's like sometimes you want that as part of a test, other times you need the radio silence. So that's hard, really hard to come up with tests that operate in the real world. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I, think, I think that's it for our session. Um, does anyone want to make a closing statement? Uh, I certainly don't have one, so. Uh, I would say we're, we're, at least most of us are actually around the conference um, both yeah. days, so that we're kind of here to talk to people, so find us. Yeah. And also we're gonna be having another fireside chat tomorrow with our tools team, so don't miss out on that or all the great content we have streaming tomorrow. And again, yes, come see us. Uh, we have office hours all day, and it's great to have you here. Thank you to everyone on the panel. <laughs>